Uh, there are three part three items, part two items rather, and uh, when we come up to that, we will need to pass the appropriate resolution at that time to take us into part two. Two things I'd like to say at the start, and the first one I need to say, uh, it is with uh, some sadness that I need to re report to you the death of former councillor Chris Gale. He was the member for Heavertree and he served one term and he was also a county councillor at some stage. Uh, 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 along with um, David and John Morris, he represented that area, you may remember him, uh, as a Liberal for the time. Uh, passed away sadly yesterday morning and uh, I thought I would mention that night. No. Chris was quite active within Cornerstone. He chaired several meetings within Cornerstone. There he also worked well, recently stepped down as chair of X-Access, the community transport organization. A good friend, good RMT member and former bus driver, and uh, yeah, good friend to us all. On a happier note, I like to congratulate our chief executive and mm -hmm. uh, MBE. We will, at the appropriate time, cream, get that name panel changed mm -hmm. to make sure it reflects your position. Joking to one side, cream, it's well deserved. A great tribute. We are all pleased for you and your family, and I know your family back in Wales appreciate it as well. The City of Exeter appreciates the work, the vision you brought to us and what you will continue to do for us. Well deserved and thank you very much. And I feel sure there will be other congratulations from the Lord Mayor at our next meeting, but I thought it would be appropriate for the Executive to mention it. Well done, Prim. So, um, if we've got some apologies, uh, as for the members, we've got a, a, a full house. Declarations of interest, please, if you have any, uh, declare them at the appropriate time. Uh, as I've mentioned, it's items 12, 13, and 14 going to. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. To, um, to approve the minutes, uh, I'll move the minutes of the 30th of November 2021. Can I have a second, please? Seconded. Okay. Are we all agreed? Good. Say the magic word to me. Actually, Nan's very favourable approval. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, um, item four, uh, we go into part two on 12, 13, and 14. The appropriate resolution will be mentioned at that time. My understanding is we have no public questions at this moment in time. No public questions received. Thank you very much. We're now going to um, item six, the strategic case for excellent development fund. And here you will see. There are two recommendations uh, which we note the progress of the uh, fund strategic case, recognising the complexity of the matter, and I want to say, bearing in mind the commitments I gave at the last council meeting that we would be having briefing sessions. It says additional dedicated briefings for members on the strategic case when published for the full business case and the full, for the full business case and a report to the strategic scrutiny committee on the full business case, including, if considered appropriate, the formation of the task in the finished group to review this in detail. If appropriate, that will be a matter for scrutiny in the programme board as far as I'm concerned, not a matter for me or this executive. It will be their decision. So on that, um, Kareem, can you introduce this matter for us? Thanks, Nita, and uh, I think by introducing it in the fashion that we've done, it, it makes it clear to members there's going to be ample room and time to look at the detail of the business case. And this is complex. And, and if, if I can, I just want to spend a, a bit of time on the strategic case, just to really uh, probably underline that point. So the reason for this work starting was we, we've launched Liverpool Exeter as a vision. Uh, it's a vision for how we will build in the city, recognising this is a regeneration type project. This is looking at brownfield developments. 
but the members have set very clear ambitions for development. The, the ambitions for development are to deliver a net zero city, as well as delivering health outcomes by designing a built environment that supports active travel, walking, cycling, as the preferred means of transport in the city, to solve some of our mobility solutions, which at the moment result in congestion, and how do we change the transport solutions to create a city over the next 20 years, which puts us humans at the centre of this, not cars. <coughs> and we've identified some big asks around what we need to achieve by way of quality. Beautiful buildings, beautiful architecture, and it's only now that the vocabulary in planning inspector is now embraced beauty as a concept. So what we what we are used to in the planning world is to see over promises and then the delivery. We all can point to that, even in Exeter. And we look at our urban extensions, members have been frustrated over the years that developers have built houses and community infrastructure has lagged behind. And when it's arrived, it isn't necessary at the quality that we want to achieve. Which essentially means the public sector has to pick up the tab and rectify what has been the shortcomings because of the way the property market delivers development. It's a structural problem. It isn't an accident specific problem. It's a problem with the planning system, and we know the conversation nationally about reforming the planning system to address what everybody sees as a manifestly failure of the planning system. And it's because development, you've got to look to the financing to understand what is happening. So those cities that have essentially the private sector delivering the development on a piecemeal, side-by-side -side basis, what we hear is finance being funded through the private sector, volume of house builders building homes, and then we have a war of attrition around the viability of development to fund all the things that they said they would do. So the pretty drawings that comes in with the plan application, which shows a nice corner shop and cycling and all the landscaping, ends up being a conversation about viability and that they can't possibly fund all these things because the demands on the development is so high. And we know there's a reality about that. The demands on the developers are very high. But it's often because finance and the way the volume house builders operate, which is essentially the key KPI is their profit and return on investment, it means places like Exeter as a city, over time, say the under-provision of infrastructure commensurate with the size of the population we end up having to support and it's the public sector that has to pick up the tap. So we've had a conversation from day one, knowing full well the task in front of the city, we need to find a solution, and at the moment there isn't a solution. Right? So what we're doing is absolutely trailblazing. And I know there's been an immense amount of frustration that you haven't seen the detail. You've heard of the city fund, we haven't seen the detail, and that's because we happen to have accountants working on the model to demonstrate how the model could work. Before we brought it to members, we've had to do a, a lot of due diligence on the model. And that document will go to you as members before it goes anywhere else in order to understand how it works. It's being funded, this work, by the one public estate. And we've got significant funding from government departments to look at this because government is interested in how you solve this problem. Because the reality is, it's the government who picks up the tab for the under delivery of infrastructure. But no matter how it's paid for, it's always the government who ends up paying for it. And what we've said, there has to be a better way of doing this. And if we can do it and try it, then it's available for everywhere. So when the One Public Estate funded this piece of work, it was done on the basis of the first objective being, it must be replicable. We'll do it on Exeter model, but it might be other big cities, other places where the government thinks this might be applicable, where the scale of investment and the scale of the outputs in terms of house building might justify a big strategic investment, investment like this. And you, when you look at it in members, you will see the scale of investment that we require. Now, 
The difference is this. When the traditional SIL, Community Infrastructure Levy, looks at the challenge, what it does is build an infrastructure on what I would describe as sort of the obvious infrastructure, like a secondary school, a primary school. What it's not building in is to the full ambition that we've got for place. So when you say you want to create a net zero city, all of us know how difficult that's going to be and the areas we're going to need to explore. That's not necessarily going to be things that house builders are thinking that's their problem. Because the government doesn't require it. So if I'm going to have a conversation with a developer about building the net zero, my head is already in the space of how do we find mobility solutions? How do we get freight come into the city without having to use HE vehicles? How do we provide facilities for mobility hubs so that people, if they need to charge vehicles, can charge? If people come into the city, they can transfer the bikes. And then if they get on buses, that the buses are, 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 are all electric buses. The developer is just pointing to national guidance and saying, I understand the direction of travel going, but we don't have to do that. So why are we expected to contribute to that? Now, what happens in a city like Exeter? I came in 1999 in the city, and they were quoting me £58,000 for a house in Exeter. You won't get that house in Exeter 20 years later for less than £300,000. When you look at how value is built up, how much of that value is built because of the work we do? What you do in local authorities is you create a local plan and you say that's the direction of travel as far as the city is concerned. We are going to be investing in the following infrastructure that creates the environment for the private sector to understand their investment can be made without much risk because they know the public sector, the transport authority, the education authority, are all going to be invested in accordance with that plan. And you all do it. Every one of you make a decision about purchasing based on the vision and sense of confidence of where this place is going. And we publish a vision that talks about world-class education, and we mean world-class education. We talk about green infrastructure. You talk about all those improvements, all that hits price and properties. So when you were looking 20 years into the future, the investments that we make return for those private investors 20 years enhanced values. But that enhanced value doesn't come to us in the public sector who have created that value. So we've said, let's have a look at the building of model of funding where the funding isn't financed by the private sector, it's financed by the public sector coming together with equity investment from government to create the finance at the beginning of the exercise for us to deliver the infrastructure and to control the way house building is done. So that the uplifting values come back to us because we own the assets. We service the financing of the fund based on traditional ways, but it's public owned. It's government owned, our own. It's a very different kind of model. So we want the impact of that fund to be in the form of not like some of the house builders who get massive returns and call credit to them, they take a lot of risk, but they get their returns to go back to their shelter. We want that return to go back to the public sector, which is effectively the people having to pick up the tab for all these things. So the strategic case sets it out. Now there are lots of issues associated with this which you're going to take apart and understand. And I'm saying this is a big deal. Right? If, if we could convince government to do this, it would be a major, major achievement in the public sector. There's a lot of work to be done. But we've had the ambition to come up with a model. No one else has done this. This is what the government has funded. It's going to be almost a million pounds of funding going in to develop this model. 200,000 already been spent in building the strategic case. Now we're working on the individual business case. And we've had people like Deloitte's. If we've had a finance first model, we've got the accountants looking at it to make it stack up as a financial model, not plans, not people like me. We might draw a nice picture. No, I want to know how it knows does this stack up financially. So, if you look at the report, you look at the objectives that are being set by the more public estate, and 
if you look at that, what he says is publicly owned, impact driven, so place making, uh, things that we want in terms of those out outcomes. That's what all members want, is the outcomes. Professionally run, locally retained profits. Those are the principles on which, which we built the concept. So, if I could, uh, Leader, uh, I'm suggesting that the business case, which will be very, very shortly, is given to members for scrutiny to decide how they want to break it down, that you get a number of witnesses, because I think you're going to need to hear from a number of professionals who have been involved with this to explain it, for you to be able to take a uh, view on it. It's predicated on other partners being involved with this kind of concept. So the county council, university, hospital, they've all been cited on the work that's being developed today. So you might want to satisfy yourselves on where they all stand on, on, on the concept. But it's fundamentally, Liverpool Exeter is a 12,000 home project, not conceived as individual sites delivering homes, it's about place shaping, delivering our wider ambition and making sure we've got the finance available to deliver that program in this environment. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Um, we could do several evenings on this. And as I said, we've committed to having um, the full business case to come forward. And also, I wanted to go to the program uh, scrutiny board who would then pass it on to scrutiny for them to set their agenda, for them to say how they want to deal with it, and I'll be giving you more rather than uh, myself leading it. So, uh, Councillor Moore, before we go into discussion, uh, yes, what would you like to say? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so it's very interesting reading the paper in Appendix 1 about the strategic case for investment. And we absolutely do need to raise finance to invest in transforming our economy in the built environment. So I do agree with that if we're going to achieve net zero. So um, your presentation is a very helpful one and I've just got a few thoughts based um, just on the strategic issues really. Um, but I think it's quite straightforward to answer, but I also think would help with the scrutiny. So I asked a question in the council in the summer about which council assets have been used to model this fund. I was told that that wasn't known yet. So I'm more interested to know more about the principle, really. So is it intended that the assets that are put in the fund in exchange for equity by the council and other partners are currently owned assets, or are they ones that might be developed as a result of the fund, such as infrastructure or build to rent um, accommodation? Um, secondly, the paper completely focuses on the um, achievement of Liverpool Exeter, and I do welcome the goal that this should be net zero development. However, as we all know, there is much to do across the rest of Exeter, such as retrofitting the current housing stock, and the council obviously started on the council housing, but there's quite a lot of other housing that needs to be done. And the council has said already via the Audit and Governance Committee that it won't be proceeding with a retrofit company. So, I would like to know if this fund is intended to invest in measures to reduce carbon emissions across the rest of the city that isn't a livable exeter, and would that be an equal priority? Um, I make a comment about governance as well, um, and I'd be interested to know if um, the other organisations listed as partners will be presenting to their governing bodies uh, a similar report um, to that presented to this. Um, and in the publicity recently, uh, Global City Futures has not been highlighted as a partner. I understand it's a member of Exit City Futures. And can you clarify their role in um, Exit City Futures going forward? And this project, are they still involved? I think. Okay, thank you, Diana. So we started the scrutiny process already, and that's not really what I wanted to do. Many of those things, Councillor Moore, needs to come forward for the scrutiny, and I think they all require questions, but I don't think it's going to change a great deal. You mentioned one thing about um, auditing government saying there will be a retrofit company. 
No, sorry? They have said it, they won't be. Right, okay. Well, I didn't know that we handed over policy making to the Audit and Governance Committee. So they need to get aware of that. That um, if there is a case for a retrofit company at some later stage, we will put that to them audit and governance as a role in scrutinising that and whatever, but they do not have a role in formulating policy on this matter. So just make that clear and if I need to speak to the chair and deputy chair on that matter, I will in the offices. Now some of the other points you have referred to, uh, Councillor Moore, I'm going to be here all night dealing with those and I'm not saying they're not without merit, I think they are listening to some of them. And there's many of those answers we need to fill, but they are detailed questions. I'm happy for you to give a rough indication, but I do not want to start the scrutiny process at this stage when I'm committed overwhelmingly to make sure we have a proper scrutiny uh, process, which all councillors can participate in, mm -hmm. chief executives. Uh, you won't, won't take long. Um, uh, when we have the scrutiny committee, we will make sure that the people who are involved with the modelling, because it's been modelled on the whole program, child family homes, and all of that. It's, it's been, been in quite a, an involved process. So we'll have a look at that. The, the, um, the question then of which assets, the principal is an asset based vehicle, meaning those like asset properties would have the choice of putting assets into a fund and either selling it to the fund and getting the capital receipt or putting the asset into a fund and holding on that as equity to the long term and then seeing the appreciation. So that's the question uh, and, every, and every asset owner would have the similar kind of opportunity. Um, the retrofit issue is an interesting one because that's exactly what City Futures will do. So when another half of mine, uh, what we will be doing is looking at vehicles for how we would deliver a retrofit to the non-council housing stock and we will be exploring how we may do that. But we haven't taken a decision on a retrofit covenant simply because at the moment our housing HRA is delivering the standards probably more efficient, more cheaper than the private sector is doing and therefore we don't need to do that. But what we need to do I think is the learning from the HRA in terms of the effect the efficiency of delivering at a sub level, which is, I think, uh, an exemplar for what we can do in the private stock. And I'm going to explore in the private stock. The, the other aspect then was uh, are other institutions going to be similarly reporting this? Uh, what we will be doing for the other institutions is, is giving them, like I'm going to be doing for the uh, scrutiny committee, is the full business case and giving them then the opportunity of how they want to take it to their members uh, and each of their councils they are operate different to us and have different terms of reference so they will decide how they would do that and then uh, i think the final point was about global city futures so global city futures are doing a lot of the uh, work on the business case in their capacity uh, as consultants to um, the exit city futures so a number of, of officers have been uh, from Global City Futures engaged to produce uh, elements of the business case. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, just to say that the, uh, uh, the 151 officer tells us that it's difficult, or the monitoring officer is difficult to comment at this stage, to wait for the business case. Uh, we also have the question that there is no um, Financial implication at this moment has been funded by one public estate, and those are the recommendations. So I just want it clear. So really, I think what we're talking about is I open up any discussion is process. How we're going to handle this, as opposed to getting down to the detail, which scrutiny will help us with that and the business case. And a lot of the questions will be answered. Very good questions as well. We need to know what they are. So I'm going to open it up for discussion now, if anybody wants to come in. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> um, for those that don't know, um, my ward is in Pinho, which is one of the growth points in the city. Um, and uh, it started off with a nice master plan, uh, Hill Barton um, and uh, Monkerton master plan, which was the way it was designed to be delivered. 
Then it falls into the private sector, as Kareem has said, which brings its own profit-driven restrictions and the master plan basically <coughs> hasn't been delivered, but that's not through fault of ours, it's through the, the piecemeal development, which we no longer have the level of control over that we did. And that's the old style of doing it. And we need a paradigm shift, we do. And, and I think, as ever, this council is, is um, uh, going off to uncharted waters um, and find solutions to problems that affect the whole of the country. If, if we can deliver on this, if we can get this shift in the way the process works, we'll not only deliver in, in, the, in the development of where we're controlling the way it's developed, we'll not only deliver what the residents expect when they looked at the glossy um, sales uh, leaflet, we'll actually be delivering against the Zero 2030. What worries me in, in Pinho is the number of houses I can see going up that aren't carbon neutral. They're not. Um, and, and so we're not actually moving, we're making the problem bigger. Um, and I think this, this is the direction that we have to go. The devil's in the detail, of course, but I think that this is, a, this is the way we can make that paradigm shift and I think we need to be brave uh, and we need to, yeah, go with it. Develop the detail. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wood. Is there anybody else wanted to come in? Councillor Morse. Um, we set up Exeter City, uh, uh, City Living with the idea that we wanted to disrupt the planning system. And the nicest way in the world, it's not going to happen at any rate with our own little company that we're trying to build out. I think it is starting to shake that a little bit. And I think we have seen applications that have come in that have given a lot more to an environmental concept. So, you know, we, we have some, seen some movement, but if we need to move at the, the speed that we need to, to reach carbon net zero by 2030, we can't just keep poodling around with our little tiny company over there. We need to do something bigger. But I also completely understand that this looks on paper quite terrifying for a, a risk averse local authority. Do you know, it, it's not what we normally do. It's not how we, we, we play this game with, with civil servants and with local councillors and we all tend to be a bit, bit risk averse, otherwise we'd all be in the public sector and we'd be able to millionaire somewhere. That's not, that's not risk we, we like to take. But what I first of all think is that we need to do this if we want to disrupt the system, but also if we want to preserve some of those green spaces around the city, if we want to see our Liberal Exit programme come forward, we need we need something as big as this. But I think the thing that makes me happiest about this is the idea that strategic scrutiny can get hold of this and really tear it apart, because at the moment I've got questions and I'd like to see them asking those questions and see if they get answered, but also there'll be an opportunity, I'm sure, for us as an executive to, to poke at it as, as well. But I don't understand it well enough at this point, and I think a much bigger way of looking at it as a council and to really, really ask those awkward and difficult questions, but also be part of how we move through this is really important. So I understand why we're doing it. I also am still risk averse, and I'm still the person I described at the beginning. But the thing that makes me happier about that, that risk is the idea that we really we really start to look at finish groups and we look at different areas of this and we understand what we're doing, so I'm really happy to support the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, anybody else? Okay, and just to remind yourself, uh, page 15, the reason for the recommendation to ensure members are aware of the strategic case for the Exeter Development Fund, that's what the recommendation is going to do. We are not making any financial decisions, we are not committing ourselves to anything. Uh, we're peering over that metaphoric cliff. We're not going to jump necessarily. Uh, is this the parachute we would want before we jump? We don't know. We're going to look into it. We're going to strategic scrutiny to look at it. I think this is the way forward. Cream has suggested that they may want to get expert people in. All I know is it's taken me quite a while in reading and briefing to get myself to a position I do not expect anybody just to see this and say, yeah, I'm right up with it, right away, Phil. I need to understand a few more, there's more questions I want to ask, and I understand those questions coming forward, and they need to be asked. And we will develop a forum whereby we will share that in a transparent way with the rest of the members of this council. So I'm going to move the two recommendations from the chair. Do I second that? Second, the chair. All those in favour of the recommendations, please show. 
I can confirm that it's unanimous vote in favour of the recommendations, Chair. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so we now move on to um, item 7, which is the 22-23 um, budget strategy and medium term financial plan. And you will see we've got a recommendation that we note the contents of the report and uh, note that the proposals to establish a balanced revenue budget and capital program are approved. David, can you tell us what you've done? Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the uh, initial report um, prior to the, the full budget report coming in on February before yourselves and then on to full council uh, for approval where you will set the council tax for 2022-23. Uh, so this sets out the uh, provisional financial settlement from the government and just to give you some key uh, highlights from that settlement. Uh, unfortunately, whilst uh, the departments were given a three-year settlement uh, in the comprehensive spending review, this again is a one-year rollover settlement to local authorities. Um, the slightly better news in that is that they have further delayed the implementation of the fair funding review and the reset of the, the business rates, which means that the tax settlement is actually uh, slightly better than it was last year. So. In addition to the lower tier services grants, which we were given last year uh, for one year only, uh, we have been given that again, uh, and also a further one-off services grant. Um, those two together total around 470,000 of extra funding, uh, which partially offsets uh, the increase in national insurance contributions as part of the introduction of the new health and social care levy, uh, which Rex still will cost around £156,000 extra. Uh, additionally, uh, we've got a further one year new homes bonus settlement, £1.362 million. Pounds. Uh, as I said, business rates hasn't been touched. Uh, we're still awaiting the final uh, figures from our business rates return. Uh, and the council tax referendum threshold uh, has been set at uh, less than 2% or up to including £5, whichever is higher. Uh, and just to note, Exeter's budget strategy as set out in the medium term financial plan uh, assumes an increase of £5, although that, of course, is uh, a member decision at full council. So. The only other key issue to, to highlight is the proposed uh, capital programme. Uh, this isn't yet finalised, so I'll make that clear. So, so there may be some changes before the final uh, capital programme uh, comes to you in February. Uh, but you will note that although the uh, capital programme is significant, the vast majority of that is already pre-approved uh, and relates to the condition survey work that has been done. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, David. Okay, um, um, you see where it is. Uh, although it's a council decision, the five pounds increase, which is it here in the report somewhere, then I can't quite see it on the reality of what that increase is. In other words, on is it band B we're talking of, or is it band C we're talking about? Uh, urban just short of £160 a year now, and is it something like £3, that could be up to about £3.19 a week to the city, an increase of 10 p something like that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's slightly slightly more than that now. Um, I think it will go up to £165 um, per year. Per year for, yes. for the city council. Um, yeah, it's it's not significant. It's uh, three three percent increase uh, in in council tax roughly, which is is actually slightly lower than um, CPI inflation makes at the at this moment in time. Okay, just for anybody, the members of the public watching, that's the bit that comes to us one hundred and sixty five pounds per year. Okay, I'll open it up to the floor for anyone, councillor. 
Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to <coughs> recall um, the fact that uh, all councillors were invited to a briefing on the budget uh, last week, um, and where Dave spent nearly an hour explaining uh, the intricacies to us, and we uh, questioned him on various bits that uh, we, we maybe didn't quite understand. Um, and so this might explain to the public um, that a lack of questions this evening because uh, Dave did such a good job at that meeting. So thank you, Dave, very much. Yes, is there anybody else at this stage? No? Just two things that I would draw attention to perhaps is one inflation, uh, despite our estimates in their inflation could be going anywhere at this particular moment in time, that found uh, an outturn at the end of it all. And also, of course, the staff pay award. And just to remind everybody, despite what's in there for a staff pay award, this council will honour, and I hope this pleases the officers here, this council will honour all paid negotiations which are made at the appropriate level, and we will implement those increases. That is uh, an assurance that we always get. So, David, any the way inflation you want to tell us? So, uh, inflation uh, is, is obviously significantly high, uh, and, and inflation for, for the council uh, it is quite a significant added cost. So, uh, roughly £625,000 uh, being added next year for inflation, and that assumes a pay award of 1.5%. Uh, I will remind members that uh, the pay award for this financial year has not yet been agreed um, and, and therefore you know, it, it's based on an assessment of, of what may be next year. Uh, uh, but it will be what it will be, as you rightly point out, it's a nationally agreed pay award, it's not agreed by the, the council itself uh, and, and we tend to, to honour that. Uh, Inflation is also significant uh, for the council in, in areas that, that every household will be painfully aware of, uh, such as utility costs, uh, fuel, uh, are all significant drivers of, of our costs as well. So uh, it's, it's a significant issue uh, for, for us as well as, as, as households. Okay, thank you David. On that point then, uh, we have one recommendation before us that we have the content of the report. The issue of the increase in the council tax, if at all, of course, goes to a full council meeting. And you've seen the, <coughs> uh, the status of each and every council member. Uh, it has to be at that time. So, I'm going to formally move the recommendation from the chair. I'll second that, chair. Okay, all those in favour of the recommendation, please show. That is a unanimous vote in favour of recommendations, Chair, and they have been carried. Thank you, uh, Mark. We now move on to item 8, which is indeed the council tax um, base and the NNDR1 22-23. Here we have two uh, recommendations, uh, which tells us all about it. And so, uh, the 151 officer has delegated the responsibility to approve the NNDR1 return by the end of the month. David Olson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is the, the statutory report that formally sets the council tax base for the City Council for the next financial year, uh, required not only by ourselves, but by the major preceptors, Devon County Council, the police and the fire. Uh, and alongside that, uh, we also set uh, the NNDR1, which is the uh, return to government, which sets the business rates uh, and forms the basis of the business rate retention, also required by ourselves, Devon County Council, and the fire service. Um, we have a re legal requirement to uh, formally inform those preceptors by the 31st of January, uh, and this is the, the final executive before that. Uh, so I'm asking you to set the Council tax base, uh, which will be set at 37,666 band B equivalent properties, which is an increase of around 289. Um, 
the business rates, as I mentioned, isn't quite ready yet, so I'm asking the delegation to me to formally sign that off and inform the, the preceptors and the government uh, in advance of the 31st uh, of January deadline. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, David. If there are no questions all now, I'll formally put the two recommendations uh, to the floor. Second down. Second down. Okay, all those in favour of the recommendations, please show. That is unanimous vote in favour of the recommendations, Chair, and the helping cabinet. Thank you, Mark. Item 9, Housing Rents and Service Charges, 22-23. And I'll ask uh, Councillor Wright to read the three recommendations here, please, before we come uh, to uh, take on this one. Laura. Okay. Um, so the recommendations are that executive recommended council they approve rents of council buildings are increased by 4.1 percent from the 1st of April 2022. The garage rents are increased by 4.1 percent from the 1st of April 2022, and the service charges are increased by 4.1 percent, with the exception of charges specified in paragraph 12.3 from the 1st of April 2022. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Dave Bolshevik. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to make three observations in presenting this report to you uh, because 4.1% increase in, in rents uh, seems significant. Uh, I would just observe that at this time last year, I was presenting to you uh, rise of 1.5% uh, CPI at that time was running at 0.5% which was significantly lower than the medium term financial plan uh, assessed for the HRA uh, and therefore this is slightly catching up on, on the loss of income from last year. Secondly, uh, council tenants did benefit from five years of a 1% reduction year on year in housing rents and thirdly uh, the increase uh, a week is around £3.18 for a typical uh, two bedroom flat uh, and our typical rent of £80 a week compares with housing associations at £89 a week and in the private sector it would be around £180 a week uh, therefore it's still uh, the lowest rent uh, in the city for for a property. Uh, and again, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, David. Just before we open it up to the floor, I think Councillor Wright, there's a, a title somewhere you want to tell us about. Yes, thank you. In um, recommendation. It's been pointed out. Thank you, Karim, in the recommendations that it should read 11 points. Three instead of one point three. It's on the papers, isn't it? Good. Good. That's inflation for you. Uh, okay. Any 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 questions or observations on this? Okay. If not, thank you. I'll put the three recommendations. I'll move them from the chair. All those in uh, for the second one, please. Second. Oh, yes. I mean, oh, sorry, Laura. Okay. Um, yes, um, just to sort of echo what Councillor Williams said about the budget, this looks as if we're all just um, very quickly rushing through some um, renting increases without any further thought and discussion. Um, as we all know in this room, there's been an awful lot of discussion around this uh, with myself, with the housing team, as portfolio holder, with the housing board. Um, with the executive, so we have hammered out all of the um, questions, and we do know that everybody is um, very much behind this for all the right reasons. But I just thought I'd point that out, um, so members of the public don't think we're, we're taking this lightly because we don't. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. You are correct. The work has been done, and the consultation has been done uh, beforehand with the relevant boards. Okay, those are the three recommendations. I'll move them from the chair again. I will second them, Chair. Thank you. All those in favour of the recommendations, please show. That is unanimous vote in favour of the recommendations, Chair. They have been carried. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 10, the local 
council tax support scheme 22-23. There is one recommendation. Uh, Councillor Williams, if you can read the recommendation for us, please. Uh, the executive agrees and recommends to council that the scheme in place the current year continues for 2023, sorry, 2022 to 2023 without substantive changes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, Binder, would you like to introduce it for us, please? Thank you, Chair. This report seeks funds to remain for the local council tax support scheme for working age residents for 2022 to 2023. The scheme for people who receive pensions is a different one and nationally uh, mandated. So members are required to approve the local scheme every year, so it's before you this evening. Now members of the executive may recall that pre-pandemic officers were minded to bring forward to members for their consideration some amendments to the local scheme. But for the reasons that have been outlined in section three, officers feel that given the current uncertainties, about the impact on the pandemic of some um, potentially vulnerable households and their incomes. Um, some of those households would be the same ones affected by any proposed changes potentially. So we wanted to take the time to do some extensive modelling on the scheme so that we fully appreciate that what the impact would be before bringing proposals forward to members. As a secondary issue, officer capacity is currently being deployed to administer the government support schemes to local businesses and residents, and also the required IT isn't yet in place to um, make us feel confident about changing the scheme. So for those reasons, Chair, the recommendation is that members support the proposal to keep the current scheme as is for another year. Thank you. Thank you, Binda. Okay, I'll open this one up for the, the floor. There's no, there is. Councillor Williams. Um, again, and there's been a considerable amount of discussion um, on this particular um, uh, item. And I want to take the opportunity to thank and congratulate the team of officers who have been working so hard to support uh, the residents of Exeter and businesses um, with the, um, uh, through the pandemic with um, implementing various financial help and schemes. We have to turn things around in six months. You get a government announcement. We hear that exactly the same time as the general public. Our phone lines get swamped, as you can imagine. Um, we have Bindu as a team having to develop um, application forms to actually work out how to um, uh, implement the scheme, understand the restrictions, and then actually um, assess claims and then make the payments. So it has involved a huge amount of work for officers, and they have worked their socks off to help the, um, the residents and the businesses of Exeter. So thank you very much, Bindu, uh, and your team. Yes, thank you, Councillor Williams. You are right to uh, recognise the staff and the hard work that they have done year on year and in particular through the pandemic. It is appreciated by us all. And I think by those people who received the support. So there's the recommendation on the uh, screen there. So I'm going to move the recommendation from the chair. Second it, chair. All those in favour of recommendations? <coughs> unanimous vote in favour of the recommendation. It's happy character. Thank you, Mark. Item 11 is the housing ombudsman's um, complaint, handling cold self-assessment. And here we have one recommendation. This one's yours, isn't it? Without having to try and say that word, so I can just say the recommendation is that we know the report, Chair. Okay. Uh, Finjan. Chair, to give you a break from Erin for me, because I've got a couple of uh, reports following, I'm going to ask Lawrence to take you through key points, yeah. if that's okay. Thank you, Leader. Um, thank you, Bindu. Uh, members may be aware that uh, the Council's housing service complaints are overseen uh, by the Housing Ombudsman and not the Local Government Ombudsman, so there's a different set of regulation. And uh, the Housing Ombudsman requires us to complete a self assessment exercise, which is contained within the report for you to uh, consider. Um, 
Thank you, Lawrence, and I'm glad you were able to say it three times <laughs> when I stumbled on it once, and I'm not going to say it this time either, but thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Lawrence or contributions? No? So, as I say, once again, it's been for the advisory board, the community discussion, very important what Lawrence said at the end there, uh, they saw nothing wrong with the process. All those in favour, I'll move the uh, recommendation from the chair. Okay. Uh, all those in favour of the recommendations? That is unanimous vote in favour of the recommendations, Chair, and they have been carried. Thank you very much. That concludes the part one of the meeting. Uh, Rob, thank you very much. We just have to have a vote to move on. And now, um, Mark, we've got the recommendation now that we go into part two. I'm not going to read all the details, but it is part of the Local Government Act of 1972 that we have to formally pass. A motion to exclude uh, the press and the public. I'm going to move that from the chair. I second it, chair. All those in favour? That is unanimous vote, chair. The meeting has been moved into part two. Thank you.